And we're going to hear now from some of Brendan's students and uh, the particular work that they've been doing. First up is Kerry Lukies. Kerry's been involved with the Trust work for some years now. She is very much one of our go-to people for field projects. And it turns out she writes a pretty good master's thesis as well. Kerry. Um, hey everybody, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my master's project today. This is one of three talks from me, um, one of which I found out about at about 8 o'clock last night, but this one <laughs> I'm prepared for and have practiced. So I'm going to just start by giving you a little bit of background on little blue penguins for those of you that aren't that familiar with them. Uh, they are the smallest of the 18 penguin species at only 30 centimetres in height. And they're also the only blue ones. The rest of them are all black and white. They're found throughout uh, southern Australia and New Zealand. And there's an estimated 470,000 worldwide with 65,000 of them found in New Zealand. And um, they're also known as fairy penguins in Australia, so that might be a term that you've heard too. Uh, they spend most of their time foraging at sea, where they eat small fish and squid and crustaceans, and they really only have to come to land to breed and to molt. And when they do come to land, they, um, they come ashore at night, and that's thought to avoid avian predators such as gulls and skua. When on land, they live in burrows mainly, so burrows in the dirt, um, rock caves and crevices, under the roots of trees such as Pahutakawa, and very occasionally, they will go in these really nice nest boxes that we build for them, which makes them easy to study when they're in them. Uh, so during the breeding season, which runs from July through to December in the Hauraki Gulf region, they will lay two eggs, which they will incubate for about 36 days um, before hatching two little fat fluffy chicks that they'll look after for a couple of weeks um, with one parent attending those chicks before both parents go back out to forage um, in order to feed those growing babies. And then chicks will fledge at about seven to eight weeks of age, so that that's when they leave the nest and go foraging by themselves. So molt is the only time other than breeding that they actually require to come to land. So that's where they replace all of their old um, worn out feathers with brand new waterproof ones. So they forage intensively in the weeks leading up to molt to gain quite a lot of weight to withstand the three weeks um, that they are stuck on land replacing their feathers. They also look quite scruffy during this time. Um, they will sometimes get found by members of the public who think they found a sick penguin, but this is also when they're quite vulnerable to predation, especially by um, dogs on the mainland. So now to my study. So I looked at um, penguins as really fine scale marine ecosystem indicators. So they are not migratory. They stay sort of uh, roughly near their, their nest year round. Um, so they reflect their local marine environment. And I um, compared penguins over both space and time, so three different colonies in the Hauraki Gulf was sort of a spatial comparison. And the museum specimens that Brendan spoke about was my comparison over time. And also um, some specimens collected by Massey University after that big die off um, at the beginning of last year, which a lot of you probably remember. So my three study sites were Motumuka Island, or Lady Alice, and the Marotiri Island group, uh, Tawharanui, and Otata Island and the Noises Islands group. So to look at foraging, um, I did a GPS tracking study. So that involved attaching these small GPS trackers to the backs of penguins with uh, super glue and duct tape to see where they went. And this involves um, recapturing those birds again to get the trackers off in order to get the data off them. And these were the tracks from eight penguins um, from Motumuka Island. Uh, so you can see that they all went from the colony, which has um, got the red star on it, all directly westward towards the mainland. One of them travelled up to Ocean Beach, but the majority of them stayed down in Bream Bay. Uh, I wasn't able to track penguins from Tawharanui or Otata, 
because I had a big permit delay and only got a permit quite late in the breeding season, so by that point it wasn't feasible to do three tracking studies, but got these ones, so I was pretty happy with that. So why did they forage there? And we'll just go back and have a look. So you can see those um, bathymetry contours that are put in, so that's the, the seafloor depth. So they typically forage in um, water shallower than 50 metres, and that's because of their small size, they can't dive very deep, um, and also sort of where their prey live. Uh, Breen Bay is also a known pilchard spawning ground, so that is um, one of their prey species. And also because of uh, the nutrient output from the Whangarei Harbour. So um, another thing that I looked at for the foraging was stable isotope analysis. This is a little bit complicated, but I'll explain it in a simple way. So you can kind of um, detect what prey and where a penguin has been foraging based on the carbon and nitrito nit nitrogen signatures in their tissues, so such as feathers. Um, so nitrogen can kind of give you an idea of the prey trophic level that they've been feeding on. So so higher nitrogen is a higher trophic level, and a trophic level would be, say, the difference between a carnivore and a, like a carnivorous fish and a herbivorous fish, or between sort of um, a crustacean and a plant. Um, whereas the carbon signature tells you whether they've been furthering, uh, foraging close to land or further from land, based on the carbon from phytoplankton and from terrestrial plants. So that's how you can kind of tell where and what they've been foraging on from um, stable isotopes and their feathers. So back to those three study sites. And what I saw um, was that the, uh, the museum specimens, so those penguins that were collected over the past 130 years, they had a more inshore carbon signature than the contemporary penguins. And that the penguins from Otata Island had a very slightly higher um, nitrogen content in their feathers than the other groups. But actually all groups kind of had quite a similar diet because um, the difference between a trophic level is about three or four um, isotopes, whereas I only saw a difference of about two. And so why did we see these differences? Um, so I kind of, I didn't determine why, but these were just sort of just some thoughts that I had was that possibly there's uh, less competition for food in the inner gulf, so around Otata Island, because there's less seabirds and less large fish. Um, so maybe better quality sort of prey, um, higher trophic level prey for the penguins um, in the inner gulf. And that possibly uh, primary productivity has moved further offshore over time, which is why we might have seen a um, more inshore carbon signature in the museum specimens. <coughs> back to the study sites just to refresh your memories. And for the stress hormones, so I looked at stress hormones in their feathers um, and I found that the museum specimens actually had far higher stress measurements than any of the contemporary groups, which was quite an interesting find. We would have kind of thought it would be the other way, but. And um, of the contemporary groups, Motumuka, so Lady Alice Island, had the highest stress levels. And so I thought that um, potentially the highest stress levels in the Motumuka group might have been due to uh, competition. So there's quite a lot of penguins that nest on the island and five other species of burrowing seabird. Um, so there's probably quite a lot of competition for nest sites on that island and potentially food surrounding it as well. And also there's a um, commercial bait fishery up in Bream Bay which uh, could potentially be competing with the penguins for those small bait fish. And similarly with the um, high stress me measurements in the museum specimens, I sort of thought that potentially that was because there might have been more seabirds um, and large fish competing for food. Uh, sort of when those samples were collected, so last century, as opposed to the contemporary penguins. So I concluded 
by saying that, yep, you can use little blue penguins as marine ecosystem indicators on a really small scale, um, especially during that breeding season when they are really confined in their foraging, but that you should look at foraging ecology and stress physiology in conjunction with breeding success, um, as breeding success really shows uh, the impact of those marine fluctuations um, on the penguin populations. And I just threw this one in there. So I overlaid the sediment disposal sites for the upcoming Whangarei Harbour dredging over my penguin foraging tracks. And you can see where the sediment disposal is likely to occur is right in the middle of where those penguins are foraging. And that is likely to um, increase turbidity in the water and make it quite hard for them to find their prey. So ideally, those sediment disposal sites would be moved further offshore or um, if that could be done outside the penguin breeding season, that would really benefit the population up at Motumuka. Thank you, and thanks to Eden for all of your photos. <laughs>2015 we found a fluttering shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around uh, how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding in a burrow at Tafanui and I asked around how long would it take to get a shearwater breeding Eden. I'm going to try. <laughs> Kia ora. Uh, Kerry and I have been roped into giving a lot of talks today, so you're going to be hearing from me a lot as well. Um, I'm Eden. I take photos of seabirds, but I also study them. So I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of Auckland with Brendan. I did my master's with him as well. Sorry, Brendan, I'm not talking about grey-faced petrels today. I'll mention it briefly, but I want to focus on the new, what I am doing now. And because I started in March, I don't have any nice results to show you, so I don't have any pretty pictures. Um, but I am going to give you sort of the background of why I decided to do this project, why, how it's all come together. Um, so it's not the sort of proposal talk I'd give at the university. I'm going to give you the reason and the goal and why I'm really, really excited to be doing this project and also some of the frustrations that have come along with it. So I've lived in Auckland for about eight years now, um, but it's only in the f past few years doing my masters at the university that I've come to realise what an amazing place this is for seabirds. We have such diversity, we have such endemicity, it's really, really spectacular. And these birds are really easy to access. It's quite easy for us to get out to these islands where they breed and look at how their lives are getting on. So I feel quite proud and I feel quite protective of what we have here and the reason I'm doing research is so that we can have some tangible conservation outcomes to look after these birds into the future. Because this is what we see out in the Horeki Gulf and this used to be probably a lot bigger than what we see now. These are still spectacular workups of fish and birds and I love birds, that's the reason I study them but I'm also interested in the ecosystem as a whole the relationships between the plankton under the water, the fish and the birds and how it all comes together. So for my PhD, this is what I wanted to focus on. I'm choosing species that will let me look at these relationships and in there are fluttering shearwaters, in there are fairy prions and bullish shearwaters. So a few of those I'm going to be studying. And these are fluttering shearwaters, as James said, not a lot is known about them. They're one of our most ubiquitous birds in the Gulf. You go out, you see huge, huge rafts of them. Um, we know very little about where they breed, they're in patches here and there, but nothing to account for these numbers that we see. They're quite hard to survey, as I've discovered this year in looking for them. Um, so Martin Berg investigated their breeding ecology, which is why their hatching takes about 50 days. We've got five very fat fluffy chicks sitting in nest boxes at Tafranui at the moment that I went out the other day to see. Um, but these common little birds hold quite a lot of potential as measures for the health of our gulf. Brendan's talked about indicators, which is great. You're all familiar with that. Um, these birds cover a region of high interest and they're here all year round. Most of them are anyway. The vast majority of the population of fluttering shearwaters are non-migratory, so they rely on resources in the gulf all year round during their breeding season and when they molt. Does this thing still work? Yay! No, that's backwards. I had it upside down. <laughs> so last year I 
wasn't doing academic work. I was doing a lot of work with the Northern New Zealand Seabird Trust, and we did surveys of Taranga, of Hen Island and the Marutiri, Chickens Islands, and we were primarily looking for fluttering shearwaters. We were following up on old surveys and old reports of where they've been breeding in the Hauraki Gulf. And we found some, but to our surprise, we actually found a lot more little shearwaters that cute, adorable little ball of fluff in the middle there. Um, and there's all these birds living in the same place. They all breed around the same time. They all seem to be feeding on the same thing, doing the same thing. How do all these birds coexist together? So this is the enigma. This is a little shearwater. We don't see these birds at sea so much. And when we do see them, they're a lot further from land than fluttering shearwaters. They don't aggregate together. They're really quite solitary. So these might be more pelagic foragers. They might be further out. And looking at these two species might tell us different things about different spatial areas of the Gulf. So Brendan's talked a lot about indicators. It's all spurred from this paper by Cairns a long time ago. Talking about seabirds as indicators is a great buzzword. People really latch onto that. They're like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. The problem is we haven't done a lot of this in New Zealand. To use a seabird as an indicator for the health of the marine environment, you're actually looking at something really, really specific. So there hasn't been a lot of investigation of how things like seabird breeding success actually relate to changes in the marine environment. We don't have the links to put this picture together. This is a gap in our literature. And it, for me, it's an opportunity because this is what I want to focus my PhD on, is bringing these links together. And it looks a lot like this. I'm a very visual person. I've spent a lot of this year scribbling on pieces of paper, drawing seabirds, drawing cute chicks, figuring out what, how do I need to go about answering the questions that I want to ask. And it's all very well to have a question and have a vague idea of where the research is going. But for a PhD, you need to be really concentrated on how you're going to answer this question. And your sampling design is really important. And I can't just go out there and track a whole bunch of birds and then come back later and say, oh, what is this showing me? I have to figure out how I'm going to collect the data so that I can answer the questions I want to ask. I need to plan ahead so that I can do analyses and actually come up with something meaningful. So what's the question? I don't really have a question. I have a very broad idea of what my question is going to be and little aspects that are going to come together. And part of it is investigating some of this basic biology of fluttering shearwaters and little shearwaters and fairy prions, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, but I want to tie all of these things together. I want to tie together fluctuations in environmental variables, so sea surface temperature. How does this impact the energy into the system, what the birds are feeding on, the availability and the energy content of their food, of plankton and fish? How does this impact adults' behaviour while they're raising chicks and their body conditions? So looking at blood, looking at their physiology, and also looking at their movements, how far they're going to forage, where they're going to forage. And ultimately, how does this impact chick condition and chick success? Chicks are the ultimate output of any breeding event, so by looking at them we get a really good indication of how the population's going. And we can keep looking at this year on year. A PhD is three years, I get three seasons to look at this and see how things change in relation to the marine changes year on year. So I want to draw all this together. So far, I'm two thirds of the way through my first field season. It's been intense, although there are huts on some of the islands that we stay in. Um, but it's been a lot of staying up very late at night, collecting blood samples, processing them during the day. We're extremely fortunate to have some truly, truly spectacular islands to work on, like the Four Nights Islands. And the reason I've been doing a lot of work there is because these little birds are really, really hard to find. So I had this grand plan of sampling a certain number of fluttering shearwaters year on year. Um, we haven't found that many fluttering shearwaters. <laughs> I wrote a list last week of all the things that hadn't worked this year because I was frustrated. It's really annoying when you're trying to do this amazing sounding project and it's just not working. And then I made a list of what we'd learned because things had gone wrong and that list is so much longer. We've learned a lot about the behaviour of these birds, the timings of when they come back to the colony, where they like to breed. Turns out it's on really inaccessible cliffs that you can't get to because they crumble out from underneath you and you fall into the sea and you die. So I'm not planning on doing that. So ultimately a PhD is about learning new things and that's what I'm doing. They might be frustrating new things and they might not let me answer the questions I want to ask, but I've got other questions to ask as well, which is where fairy prions come in. I was lucky to be a part of the work last year that the Northern New Zealand Seabird Trust started up tracking these birds, putting the little geolocators on their legs to see where they go when they migrate. They're very similar to fluttering shearwaters in what they do while they're here, so we see them foraging with those big workups. Um, so I'm 
sort of taking on that project, looking at fairy prawns as well. They've been very easy to find. They've been very reliable. So far, we've gotten back over half of the geolocators that we deployed last year. Um, we're about to go out next week and do some work on them, looking at how they're getting on with raising their chicks, which will be very small and cute and just hatched right now. So that's how I'm adapting to a very frustrating start to my PhD. Um, I'd just like to thank my supervisor, Brendan Dunphy, you're wonderful. Um, Auckland Council's given us a lot of support in terms of funding and little tracking devices, and Guy is coming out with me to Burgess pretty soon, so that's going to be exciting. And of course, Chris Gaskin and Kathy and Pete Mitchell, who have stayed up very late with me, gotten up before dawn with me many times to sit on hills and try and catch birds that don't exist. <laughs> and still enjoyed it, so thank you very much for that, and thank you all for listening. Uh, Spencer is another of um, Brendan's students and he's a good example of one of those people that has come to New Zealand specifically to study our seabirds, so it's a good boost for our economy, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. I, as James just said, and as I'm sure you can already hear, I'm not originally from here, uh, originally from Texas, and then lived in Ireland a good bit of my life, and now I'm here looking at your phenomenal seabird life. It's absolutely astounding. Uh, so specifically, we're going to be looking at the Cordera, a little blue penguin, and how we can help them waddle to recovery by studying their ecophysiology right here in the Hodoki Gulf. Oh, this one. So as we all know, and as everyone has covered today, Marine ecosystems are facing rising threats, and specifically for the Cordera, as was mentioned earlier, they've had that major crash two years ago. That's not the first time they've had those major crashes. That's happened time and again, as well as uh, events like the C.V. Reina oil spill back in 2011 that affected Cordera quite heavily. And there are quite diffuse things, things uh, like climate change, warming the seas, kicking up the sand at the bottom of the water, uh, as well as uh, fisheries just taking away their food. But Cordera, also have a very acute uh, thing for them. And that is because they are very short-ranging birds. They're much more impacted by local conditions uh, than these broad-ranging birds that are going up to California and Alaska and Japan. Cordera basically stay right where they are. So they're facing very acute, generalized urban impact. Whenever they're close to the city, they're experiencing things that are quite different from birds that are going to be further from the city. Whereas uh, these broad-ranging birds are more impacted by diffuse things than the Cordera might be. However, monitoring this is quite difficult, how these marine ecosystems are being impacted. It requires a lot of on-the-ground verification of satellite data. Remote sensing is only so useful for uh, the transfer of biomass from low trophic levels, the plankton, krill, all those little things, up into the larger things that the seabirds would be eating. And that's very expensive and it takes a long time, and it, as Brendan mentioned, it's much easier to just pick up a bird, sample them that way. And seabirds specifically will be uh, very useful for that. They go around, forage everywhere, bring together all these nutrients, take it into their body, bring it up onto land, poo it everywhere, feed it to their chicks, and transfer that onto the land where we can then sample it. They're also easily monitored as burrow nesters and pretty predictably arrive at the colony with the same route at the same time every single night. As well as Brendan covered prudent parents, Cordera are quite different from other seabirds in this way in that they can breed up to four chicks a year or down to zero, depending on how much food is available, what the environmental conditions are like. There is a little debate on that and it is a quite major debate within Cordera. It's whether they're one species or two. Uh, and that, to an extent, is kind of taxonomic pedantry, like, is it really significant to their conservation? And it kind of is, because whether they breed twice in a season, there are two chicks, or whether they breed just once, is that environmental conditions or is it something inherent to them? And that hasn't really been analyzed quite extensively because uh, most of the research going on is in Australia. There's been 130 published papers on Cordera. 123 of those were in Australia with the theoretically different species. So anything that we're looking at over there, we're not sure it's going to be the same over here. Um, particularly because they have quite a plastic ecology, not plastic in the sense of you know bags and stuff, but quite changing. Whenever they're in different environmental conditions, they'll be behaving 
be behaving quite differently, and that includes adjusting their foraging range, that if there's good conditions, they'll stick within five kilometers of the burrow, whereas if it's quite rough conditions, they might go 20, 25 kilometers from the burrow. And this is where the Horaki Gulf is a perfect place to study them, because there is a very distinct spatial scale to this environment. Whereas moving from the urban environment in the inner gulf out to the oceanic outer gulf, that usually operates over the span of hundreds or thousands of kilometers elsewhere in the world. But for Auckland, it's just you know, a couple dozen kilometers. So we'll be able to assess those very acute changes that Korara would indicate that more widely ranging species won't be able to indicate. And so we've selected four sites, Otata Island in the noises down in the south, to Terimatangi a bit further away, Tafurunui up in that mid-gulf area, which, you know, it's the mainland, but they forage out into the water representing that mid-gulf area. And then Pokihinu way up in the north, quite isolated from the city. And those red circles around the islands are essentially the maximum foraging range of a Korora, marked at 20 kilometers. And you can see for Otata and Terimatangi, they go right into the city, whereas Pokihinu doesn't even have other islands out there. There's no human impact or no acute human impact in the same way that you would have with Otata and Tiritiri Matangi. So we're looking at this with a matrix model approach, uh, taking all the inputs into the penguin and measuring the outputs that come from it. So inputs being breeding stage, rearing, incubation, pre-lay, uh, and outside of breeding season, colony location, inner gulf to outer gulf, environmental conditions like sea surface temperature, chlorophyll A, uh, bathymetry, as well as uh, uh, Carrie touched on, there might be some competition, so density of penguins around them. And then the outputs that we'll be measuring is chick rearing, stress physiology, which was covered by the previous talks as well, looking at their blood, looking at their stress hormones, and um, uh, the, what are they called? The stable isotopes. Uh, spatial foraging, we're going to be looking at where they're foraging, and prey selection, what are they eating when they're actually there, marked by the stable isotopes. And we're predicting that the inner gulf colonies will express higher stress, and the stress levels will be highest during chick rearing, especially that guard stage. This isn't actual data, this is just a representation of how it would be, because it's not just looking at one variable, and it's not looking at two variables, it's looking at how they intersect with each other and compound each other. So being in the inner gulf would be more stressful than the outer gulf, Chick rearing is more stressful than outside of breeding season, but they compound each other good to be much more stressful than each one independently. This is building off the past studies, carries that was just spoken about, Shea Vickers quokka stress or diving petrels. Uh, they're a different species, but they will overlap in the methods and what we're predicting to see from them. Uh, and then Jing Jing Zheng back in 2016 developing the behavioral inference models that we're using for the spatial behavior. Physiology, we're looking at corticosterone using ELISA protocol, and that's just looking at a hormone called corticosterone that indicates how stressed they are or is a good marker of how stressed they are, both in the feather for a longer term stress period from when they first grew those feathers in their catastrophic molt, and then their blood, how stressed are they right when I pick them up uh, when they've just gone back from their day of work. Uh, and then hematology, what are their blood parameters, uh, just like Brendan was discussing, looking at how much oxygen they can have, size of their cells, health of their cells. This is from Shea's diving petrol study, comparing Te Tiri Matangi to Pokihinu. Uh, quite a similar map to the one that was shown earlier. The ones at Pokihinu, basically circling around the island, not going very far. The ones down Te Tiri Matangi, essentially fleeing the city. They're going uh, north and east, directly away from Auckland. They're not circling the island the same way you saw Pokihinu. So they're having to move out uh, away from the inner gulf. We'd expect if Korora are seeing similar drivers, they would have similar behaviors like this. And then we will be assessing that with like gotcha trackers, what Carrie discussed. You can see one on their back right there, and assessing it with HMMM, which is just looking at hidden behaviors that are tucked into uh, the data collected from those trackers. Are they moving around uh, right now looking for food? Are they actively eating? Are they resting? Are they commuting? Uh, as well as stable isotopes telling us what they ate while they were there, and Carrie did a brilliant one on that. Uh, and we're going to model that against environmental conditions. What's the chlorophyll A situation like there? Sea surface temperature and the bathymetry, seeing what conditions is it that they're looking for to get to their prey. Chlorophyll A especially does not always transfer up trophic levels to the larger prey items, so we need to get that on-the-ground verification compared to the satellite data. How does this influence their provisioning for their chicks? How fast do the chicks grow? 
how many feeding events do they have, how large are those feeding events, and how do siblings compete with each other. And this is especially a quite new addition to the study because we saw lots of sibling competition on Tiri Tiri Matangi this year. Lots of chicks that were twice the size of their sibling. And we want to look at what's driving that behavior uh, and how will it be impacting their breeding. We're going to be looking at that using camera trapping as well as uh, in-person observation and daily weight uh, measuring of their weight and relating it back to the parental condition that was in the previous stress and all that. We're also looking at using this new technique, LAICPMS, which just rolls off the tongue, laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, <laughs> just brilliant and concise. Uh, and basically, that's just, we blast a laser at uh, a feather, and it tells us the elemental ratios within that. What we're hoping to apply this for is looking at heavy metals getting into uh, the birds. Uh, if they're close to a pollution source, is it representing that in their feathers, and is this an effective method for it? As well as, we can use it for rehabilitation and oiling response. So like when we had the C.V. Reina oil spill, uh, there were penguins just washing up everywhere, or the big crash two years ago. We could identify, potentially, and that's what we're examining, is this potentially a tool for identifying where these penguins are coming from? Is it just one colony impacted? Is it just one region impacted? Or are there a bunch of different ones? So we'll be identifying at what scales can it be used for identification of a source colony for a penguin? Does a Hawke's Bay penguin have different elemental ratios from Bay of Plenty or Horaki Gulf? And so, bringing all these disparate measures together, basically what we're looking for is not one base thesis question, but these five. Who is being impacted by stressors? Where are they being impacted most? When is the most stressful time for them? What is stressing them? And what is it changing in their behavior? And how can we influence their conservation to help them waddle back to recovery? Thank you, Spencer.